Hello and welcome to our second Advent devotional evening service together. We are so glad you could join us again and we are hopeful that you appreciated our first event uh, together and I, by the looks of it everyone did. There seems to be a pretty high view count so we're, we're happy that people are tuning in and enjoying this as we join together to celebrate this very special time of the church here, this season of Advent, this time of preparation for our Lord Jesus to come and not only just a celebration of his past coming, of course, in the incarnation, the virgin birth uh, 2,000 years ago, but in his future coming as king in glory. And that is what we look forward to, both an eye on the past and an eye on the future. Today's theme of the week, uh, the next candle we will be lighting, signifies love, love and preparation. And I have a quote here for you uh, from R.C. Sproul that I think is quite fitting. The Advent season is that time when we seek to, in a manner of speaking, mute our memory of what has already happened, that we might brighten our joy that it happened. We leave the already of his Advent to taste the bitter of the not yet. We, in short, go back that we might look forward to his coming. We'll now light the candles and sing together, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Son of God had become human and simply lived temporarily among us and then left, leaving a set of teachings. But his designs were infinitely greater than that. In the Gospel of Mark, it says that Jesus Christ chose twelve apostles and appointed them so that they would be with him. What does with him mean? From the text and the rest of the Gospels, we can see that it means being in Jesus' presence conversing with him, learning from him, having his comfort moment by moment. The purpose of the incarnation is that we would have a relationship with him. 
In Jesus, the ineffable, unapproachable God becomes a human being who can be known and loved. And through faith, we can know this love. This does not stun us as much as it should. Look at the Old Testament. Anytime anyone drew near to God, it was completely terrifying. God appears to Abraham as a smoking furnace, to Israel as a pillar of fire, to Job as a hurricane or tornado. When Moses asked to see the face of God, he was told it would kill him. That at best he could only get near God's outskirts, his back. When Moses came down off the mountain, his face was so bright with radiance that the people could not look at him. So great, so high and unapproachable is God. Can you imagine then if Moses were present today and he were to hear the message of Christmas, namely that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son? Moses would cry out, Do you realize what this means? This is the very thing I was denied. This means that through Jesus Christ you can meet God. You can know him personally and without terror. He can come into your life. Do you realize what's going on here? Where's your joy at this reality? Where's your amazement? This should be the driving force of your life, of all of our lives. When God showed up in Jesus Christ, he was not a pillar of fire, not a tornado, but a baby. There is nothing like a baby. Even young children have their own agenda and can run from you. But the little babies can be picked up, hugged, kissed, and they're open to it. They cling to you. Why would God come this time in the form of a baby rather than in a firestorm or a whirlwind? Because this time he has come not to bring judgment but to bear it. To pay the penalty for our sins. To take away the barrier between humanity and God so we can be together. Jesus is God with us. The incarnation did not happen merely to let us know that God exists. It happened to bring him near, so he can be with us and we with him. Millions of people every Christmas sing, Jesus our Emmanuel. But are we really with him? Do they know him or do they only know about him? Jesus literally moved heaven and earth to get near us. What should we be doing now to be truly with him? Bearing all this in mind, we sing together, O oh Lord, how shall I meet you?
We will now turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to come? Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This passage such a famous one, one that we are very used to, not so much at Christmas time. This is one we're usually used to celebrating after Christmas when we celebrate the baptism of Jesus further on in the church calendar year. But nevertheless, this wonderful promise that we see at the beginning part of this gospel passage, this recitation of the words of Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Well, I think this verse speaks very well to the Advent season. It says to you and me, the Lord is coming. He's on his way. Yes, the Lord has come 2,000 years ago in Jesus Christ, through the Virgin Mary, that we celebrate that wonderful incarnation. But our Lord is also coming. And so the words of Isaiah, the words repeated by the John the Baptist, I repeat today, and I simply say, as a voice calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, for he is coming. Prepare your hearts, prepare your minds, prepare your souls, prepare your lives, for our Lord is coming. Make straight paths for him. Make straight paths. Live lives that are righteous, that are pleasing to God. Live lives full of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit that is spoken of by Paul in Galatians 5. This is how we prepare the way of the Lord. By hearing the gospel, receiving it in faith, and living life empowered by his Holy Spirit. Living the renewed life that he won for us on the cross. Living in the forgiveness that he won for us on the cross. Prepare the way of the Lord. For he is coming. Hallelujah. Bearing all this in mind and considering the words of John the Baptist, we sing together, On Jordan's banks the Baptist cries.
Given that the theme of this Advent Sunday is love, I thought it fitting to share with you an Advent reflection on love written mostly by C.S. Lewis and in part by Zach Kincaid as well. Lewis has a lot to say about love. As you know, the four loves threads through the love of a mother, of a lover, of a friend, and of God himself. Each love exhibits different qualities, with agape love as the definition and conclusion of all love. As John reminds us in 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. I love what he says in the problem of pain, too. God has no needs, human love, as Plato teaches us, is the child of poverty, of a want or lack. It is caused by a real or supposed good in its beloved, which the lover needs and desires. But God's love, far from being caused by goodness in the object, that is, in you or me, causes all the goodness which the object has, loving it first into existence and then into real, though derivative, lovability. In other words, God makes what's pleasing to him with his love in you and me. God is goodness. He can give good, but cannot need or get it. In that sense, all his love is, as it were, bottomlessly selfless by very definition. It has everything to give and nothing to receive. And to pair with the reference above from John, 1 John, Lewis writes in Mere Christianity, In the higher mammals we get the beginnings of instinctive affection. That is not the same thing as the love that exists in God, but it is like it, rather in the way that a picture drawn on a flat piece of paper can nevertheless be like a landscape. When we come to man, the highest of the animals, we get the completest resemblance to God which we know of. There may be creatures in other worlds who are more like God than man is, but we do not know about them. Man not only lives, but loves and reasons. Biological life reaches its highest known level in him. If we return to the problem of pain, Lewis helps us to see how richly God loves us. He says, but God wills our good, and our good is to love him with that response of love proper to creatures. And to love him, we must know him. And if we know him, we shall in fact fall on our faces. If we do not, that only shows that we are trying to love, that what we are trying to love is not yet God, though it may be the nearest approximation to God which our thought and fantasy can attain. Yet the call is not only to prostration and awe, it is to a reflection of the divine life, a creaturely participation in the divine attributes which is far beyond our present desires. We are bidden to put on Christ, to become like God. That is, whether we like it or not, God intends to give us what we need, not what we now think we want. Once more, we are embarrassed by the intolerable compliment, by too much love, not too little. This reminds me of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Oh, and what a love that Jesus laid down the riches in heaven. As Philippians 2 tells us, in order to become the paradox of fully God and fully human, incarnate to show us this love. In the world's last night, Lewis says, a generation which has accepted the curvature of space need not boggle at the impossibility of imagining the consciousness of incarnate God. In that consciousness, the temporal and the timeless are united. I think we can acquiesce in mystery at that point provided we do not aggravate it by our tendency to picture the timeless life of God as simply another sort of time. We are committing that blunder whenever we ask how Christ could be at the same moment ignorant 
and all-knowing, that is, omniscient. Or how he could be the God who neither slumbers nor sleeps while he slept. May we experience the love of Christ in his incarnation, in the cross, and in his resurrection this Advent season. We now sing together, Prepare the Royal Highway. This is true, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It is not true that we must accept inhumanity and discrimination, hunger and poverty, death and destruction. This is true. I have come that they may have life, and that abundantly. It is not true that violence and hatred should have the last word, and that war and destruction rule forever. This is true. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. It is not true that we are simply victims of the powers of evil, 
who seek to rule the world. This is true. To me is given authority in heaven and on earth, and lo, I am with you even until the end of the world. It is not true that we have to wait for those who are specially gifted, who are the prophets of the church before we can be peacemakers. This is true. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. It is not true that our hopes for liberation of humankind, of justice, of human dignity, of peace, are not meant for this earth and for this history. This is true. The hour comes, and it is now that the true worshippers shall worship God in spirit and in truth. So let us enter Advent in hope, even hope against hope. Let us see visions of love and peace and justice. Let us affirm with humility, with joy, with faith, with courage, Jesus Christ, the life of the world. Amen.